Yes, well, <clears throat> I mean, today we, we're, we're talking about, we're talking about th that thing, the S-E-X, <laughs> sex word, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> now, there's nothing to be embarrassed about, um, much at all. Well, actually, hmm. Hello and welcome to this week's episode on how to be a great GM. Last week the players got a taste of the same video on sex and role playing and how we deal with it and how we deal with love in our games as well. Romance and all of the bits and pieces that go with it are integral to all of the stories that we looked at so fondly in terms of fantasy and science fiction. And it is those love romances, the sex component as well as the emotional connections that make those stories that much stronger. King Arthur, for example, completely destroyed Britain because his beloved queen cheated on him with his best friend. And that basically brought about the end of the golden age of Camelot. So it's a very important part in our narratives and yet we don't include it. Now from the players' perspectives we looked at all sorts of things including permissions and that kind of thing. So the very first thing that you need to look at when dealing with sex in your game, and with dealing with love in your game for that matter, is you need to make sure that the players are comfortable with it and of the appropriate age as well to talk about it and to use it in your game. Now we're not talking explicit descriptions of all kinds of liquids and fluids and things sloshing about. We're talking about two characters coming together, falling in love, their lips touching, and us moving away to another scene somewhere else. So how does sex make your game better? How does having a love interest make your game better? Well, these are my thoughts. Now, first and foremost, the whole idea of sex or of love or both is that it creates an immediate connection between the player's character and the NPC that they're about to shag or that they are falling in love with. So it's an incredibly powerful tool for you as the game master to incorporate into your game to create NPCs that the PCs actually fall in love with, that the players fall in love with. The prostitute at the brothel that they pop into, named Trix, who's always that excuse me, who's always there or who's always offering a, to lend a hand. The more she shags the fighter, the more the fighter goes back to her repeatedly, the better entrenched that NPC becomes with the players. So sex and love are a powerful tool to get players to start to form bonds with characters that are not their own. And it's a very personal bond as well. It's not just friendship. It's not just an acquaintance. It's not just humor. It is a very, very real bond of love or of shagability. So never underestimate the power of that to create memorable NPCs. Now, it can also be humorous, and I often do that to help break the tension. My players are, generally speaking, quite open and enjoy the romance and sex that can get brought into games. Sometimes, though, when it's between two player, players' characters, it can get a little bit awkward for some of the players who are not comfortable in their own skin. So it can be a very humorous moment, and traditionally the way that I make it humorous is if it's sex, I will have the player roll a constitution check, or an endurance check, or a performance check, or a dexterity check, or whatever your system uses, I'll have them roll that. And if they fail a check of, let's say, 10 or 15, or whatever the numerical system is that you use in your game, if they fail it, the consequences are the important part. The funniest, the absolute funniest moment in cinema history with regards to failed sex roles has to be when Indiana Jones falls asleep on the tanker in Raiders of the Lost Ark, just before he and his beloved start to do, <coughs> do the dirty. He falls asleep. Now that to me is a failed constitution roll, and he simply rolled a one, and so he fell asleep. It's created a wonderful moment in cinema history, and if you're a fan of the Raiders series like I am, of Indiana Jones, then it's one of the more memorable romances that he actually has. 
So that's a very good way of lightening the mood is to use humour. Describing weird and wonderful practices that the characters get involved in. I once had a prostitute that the player, his character picked her randomly out of the crowd because they were there investigating some occultist who was in the basement and walked into the room only to find that it was full of ropes and chains and decided to go along with it anyway because, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And after three hours came out of the session and um, had decided that it was quite amusing that this bondage uh, scene had played out. And so went back time and time again after a couple months. I said, all right, you now have a plus one to your rope use skill as well as to your escape skill because you've learned how to slip out of knots and you've learned how to tie them through the use of that particular prostitute in the brothel. And later on, when the entire town was under siege, those PCs went back to the brothel to save all of the prostitutes because they had become almost like family. So that whole notion, that idea of an initial humorous moment, but again tied into sex, brought all of the characters together and all of the NPCs together with those characters and made a lasting impression. So it's a very powerful tool that we often overlook because we're afraid to talk about it. Now, it doesn't need to be over the top. You don't need to describe every thrust, every grunt, every groan. We don't really need that and we don't want it. In my personal opinion, I think something like Game of Thrones, especially in season one, went over the top. We didn't really need all of that stuff. Uh, sure, visual eye candy might be your thing, but in general, it didn't make the story better. It just threw in some nudity. And is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? I don't know. That's a different video. In role playing, I always advocate that less is more. Leave it up to the imagination of the players to think about what they're getting on with in that room or a cave or open field or on the back of the dragon or with the dragon, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be over the top. It doesn't have to be gratuitous. It doesn't have to be R18. It could simply be as they kiss, Right, what are you guys doing? What are you doing? The NPC is doing that, etc., etc. You cut away and then you can come back to them later when they're lying back having a cigarette. So, how then do you overcome the difficulty of flirtation and seduction? A lot of us don't actually know how to flirt with somebody else or how to seduce somebody else. I've certainly never been an 18 year old blonde head, big bosomed lady. I don't know how to flaunt my wares. How do you do it as a game master when you have no clue how it's actually done or when you do have a clue but not for the opposite sex? This is the point where I advocate that we don't get players to run around and hit each other with swords to determine the outcome of battle. And so in this particular instance, this is one time when I would advocate you look to your game system to in for some kind of mechanical resolution. So with the seduction or with the flirtation, and if it doesn't have one, here's an opportunity for you to introduce one into your gaming system. A flirtation role. Originally, way back when, Dungeons and Dragons had a value called comeliness which was, not as your dirty mind is thinking, but which was how physically attractive the person was and charisma was how magnetic they were. So they might not be very attractive, but they were very powerful. Churchill, for example, was not a poster boy uh, for the war, except that he was only because of the way that he spoke and the way that he rallied people around him. His charisma was high, his comeliness value was very low, unless you like bulldogs. So they had a system where there was that differentiation between physical characteristics and uh, internal spiritual characteristics, if you like. So you can bring in some kind of system where it is a case of, okay, well, my character tries to flirt with the barmaid. Right, what is your character going to say? You don't have to act it out. You don't have to walk up to the gym and go, oh, well, look at you. I'm so... Mm. Because everyone's going to burst into laughter and the person doing it is going to feel silly. So what you could say is, all right, well, I'm going to compliment her on her hair. I'm going to talk about how that apron really brings out the best in her eyes and that kind of thing. All right, make your seduction role or your flirtation role or whatever the mechanic is that you want to bring in. I would go that route. I wouldn't try and have players have to act out how they are going to flirt with someone, even though we get them to act out dialogue between diplomats and negotiations and interrogations and that kind of thing. So that's where I would bring in mechanics. Now, just to bring this whole thing about sex together, 
It's a powerful tool that creates lasting impressions on the players, if you don't overuse it. Now, the challenge, of course, is you have to make sure that it's appropriate to all ages at your table and anyone who might overhear you as well. When it comes to that tricky thing of rape and whether you're going to have the orc rape that poor maiden or whether the stormtrooper is actually going to be some kind of deviant who drags people off to do dastardly things to them, that's up to you. But again, it's about judging just how far you can push it with your players and making sure that the sensitive subject doesn't spoil or roll over from the table and uh, roll out into personal lives and things. It is a very powerful and very, very strong statement to make. So think about using it, but use it sparingly. This is not something that you want to use as an over the top. Now, there are a couple books that have been published for various systems that deal with the erotic and with the sensual and with love. And uh, they offer similar advice and similar tricks and things, but they've got tables for all sorts of weird and wonderful things. If you're curious, you can go and find those on Google. Uh, I don't have any of them personally, but uh, they are out there. Keep this as a trick up your sleeve. It throws your players off like you cannot believe when an NPC, instead of being aggressive, starts to become kind, flirtatious, generous for no apparent reason whatsoever. And it's even better if the player is oblivious to the charms and affectations of the um, said NPC right up until the moment that the NPC closes the door seductively behind them, looks at the PC and says, well, I thought you'd never ask, fade to black. Well, that's my thoughts on sex and role playing. I think it is something that we should incorporate more of because it creates better and more lasting impressions than almost any other type of encounter that you can come up with. It's something to think about in your next game, perhaps. Until next time, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. If you haven't heard about it yet, um, www.rpgtablefinder.com is our platform for you to connect with other players all over the world for either online play or round the table play, depending on your proximity to one another. And uh, that was developed by our very own Web Goblin, who's done a remarkable job on designing it and upgrading it and maintaining it and trying to improve upon it based upon the feedback that we're getting from the participants in that. If you want more information, head on over to www.greatgamemaster.com where you'll find all of our videos neatly laid out for you as well as other goodies and things and suggested books that you might want to buy as well as other odds and ends. Until next time, however, I wish you and yours the sexiest of play.